started? Okay. Uh, this is Stephen Rado, and Stephen Rado asked me to prepare a PowerPoint presentation for him, which I did. And uh, I'm sorry to say that I didn't get to all the way to the end of the chapter, but I'm, I'm short about five slides. But we have plenty of material to talk about for the next half an hour. And so I'll say what I had in mind, but it's not my material, it's his. So we'll just, and so you're free to interrupt and, and tell me. If, I mean, I'll talk if you want me to, and if you want to talk, go ahead. It's your, your presentation. So let's go ahead with the, the title talk is Revisiting Gravity, Free Fall and Inertia. We'll go ahead with the second slide. Um, uh, just click number two. Just click the second slide. If I have a mouth corner, I would just click. Just click the second slide. That's what I ended up doing. That's the best way to do it. Yeah, you can sit. Just, just you don't even have a mouse? I thought it was too. You sure it's nothing happening? Sorry. Uh, just move it around. If that's the right mouse, it should be... There you go. There it is. Boy, it's a really... <laughs> Once you get it, though, it's okay. Click number two, that's probably the quickest way to do it. Okay. Uh, okay. Click it. Well, click it again. <laughs> there we go. Okay, just to put a little context on uh, the talk, uh, Stephen Rado, as I think many of you may know, wrote a book in 1994 called Heathrow Kinematics. And if you don't have a copy of that, then shame on you, you should. And uh, he just recently came up with a new book called Heathrow Dynamics. And I assume you have copies here today for yes. people who are interested in this new book. It's an extension of the further book, and it has some new ideas as well as reinforcements of the old ideas. So let's go ahead and slide three. The, the second book, the new book, has five chapters, and Stephen asked me to reproduce the whole book in the proceedings. <laughs> I said, well, I can't do that, but I can, uh, I can either do a summary of it or reproduce part of it. So he's, I said, what's the most important part of your book? And he said, well, chapter five, that's the one that's really near that. And even there, I said, well, we can't do all of it. Uh, we can do the first half or the second half, because it was quite long, and we're trying to keep the proceedings from becoming uh, 10,000 pages long. <laughs> so he limited, he said, what's the most important part of chapter five? And he said, well, then I guess the second half. And so that's, so this is the best of the best that we're going to be talking about today. So as you can see, he talks about some important related ideas in ferromagnetism, electromagnetism, and ethromagnetism, which we'll hopefully today we'll get into what that means. And, and those all have consequences resulting in a new understanding of gravity, and that's uh, what we're going to be talking about today. Okay, next slide. So, chapter five uh, is composed of several subunits, and I, I'm going to just briefly talk about the first three because those are the three that are not in the proceedings. <laughs> so, they're not going to be d d dealt with a, a great deal in this discussion either, but he does. Yeah, but I, I would, if I were to summarize it, would it be fair to say that's a, pretty much a history of the theories of matter and, it is, uh, and the ethro kinematic theory in particular? So I would say 5.2 is a summary of your earlier book, more or less. 5.3 is again a, a, the concept behind that. So that's all review, uh, at least from the point of view of, of this chapter. So we'll move on now to the meat of this talk is, uh, well, I, I should say, we, he talks about, to begin with, the, the history of the ether and asks some pretty uh, basic questions that we should be asking. I mean, first of all, the ether is today is not a popular idea is among mainstream. And the question is, did it die in 1905? Is, is, that, the, is that the death of the ether? Um, or isn't it? Or uh, that's a question we need to answer. And have there been resurrections along the way? It's just a matter of history. Have people know, resurrected this idea even since 1905. And then can, and then probably the most profound question that he asks is, can the ether be dynamic? So let's go ahead and see if we can answer some of those questions. He begins uh, the discussion in chapter f in 5.4, just, yeah, let me start right here, with a discussion of Faraday's dipole. And I think dipolarity is a, obviously a, a central idea. Uh, and it was from Faraday's understanding of the dipole, really, in, in some sense, that the modern ether, as our, our understanding of it, 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 it really was born with this concept. Is that fair enough to say? Okay, so let's read the, the next quote. And by the way, this is one of my favorite quotes. It's in 
one that I think we should all memorize, <laughs> or at least learn part of it, because this is, this is one of the greatest scientists who ever lived, and this is what he said about energy. He said, space was not nothing, or the mere location of bodies and forces, but a medium capable of supporting the strains of electric and magnetic forces. In other words, space is doing this even where there's no, apparently no matter. There's strains of forces in there. And this is the best part. The energies of the world were not localized in the particles from which the forces arose, but rather were to be found in the space surrounding them. So in other words, he's not saying that matter is existing everywhere, but he's saying that the energy of the matter is existing everywhere. That's Michael Faraday, and he said that almost 200 years ago, and I, that is not a popular idea today. I mean, that's it's just not. So what, if we want to call that energy an ether, that's, I, you know, that's, Maybe that's what it is. We all probably have a little de a different idea of what an ether is, but that's Michael Faraday's idea. And I assume that's your idea as well, something like that. Yes. Okay, let's Maybe. go on. All right, uh, Faraday's ideas not only were important to us today, but they were important to one of our most important scientists, and that's James Clerk Maxwell. Here's what he said. And this is, uh, would it be fair to say that, the, that Maxwell's treatise on electricity and magnetism was the most significant scientific publication of the 19th century. Does anybody want to argue with me on that? Okay. So this is why he did it. So why he did the most important that publication of the century, we ought to really know that, right? Here's what he said. It's mainly with the hope of making Faraday, Faraday's ideas, which we just read, the basis of mathematical method that I have undertaken this treatise. Why did he write the most important document of the 19th century? Because he, believed, he agreed with Faraday's idea that energy is existent and resident in space and not localized to the matter itself. Okay, so that's a pretty important point. This is just an illustration of Faraday's lines of force. It's Faraday uh, was not the mathematician that Maxwell was, but he did have a, a conceptual idea of these lines of force, and lines of force coming closer and closer together causes more stress, more tension, and that's where the forces are the greatest. And you can see it in the, uh, we've all seen the iron filings and, and different things, and the dipole, exactly. That's, so this is an illustration of that. We're all familiar with these field lines, but Faraday's understanding of it was that that is where the energy is resident, is within those fields, and we, we'd see the energy the greatest in those areas where they're closest together. So let's move on. And it worked out mathematically. And it does happen that funny thing. Okay, well that's what Maxwell did. Maxwell again said that we can scarcely avoid the interference, the inference that light is the transverse undulations of the same medium, whatever it is, we can call it an ether, we can call it it's a medium, which is also the cause of electric electric and magnetic phenomena. This is the statement that connects electricity and magnetism with with light optics. And that is obviously that's monumental. I mean that's huge. And one thing to notice about this is that Maxwell's theory, and this is what you emphasize in the book, is that it was a fluid dynamic theory. It was, a, I think, and now let me just be clear, a fluid is not necessarily water. A fluid is something which is continuous in nature. That's, is that what you, I assume, what you meant by fluid? Hydrodynamic. Hydrodynamic, okay. And, uh, and that's what Maxwell thought of it in, that, in those terms. So let's move on. Okay. Next, he goes on to list, and it gives a little more extensive history than what I'm showing here, but he, he, there's no question that the 19th century was filled with people who understood ether in these terms. And was, it's also no question that, that the leaders, the intellectual leaders and, and discoverers of this way of looking at things, there were ether theories prior to Faraday, but this particular idea of energy being resident in space really owes its origin to Faraday and Maxwell. And all of these well-known scientists subscribe to that idea.